Welcome into episode 108 of the Sources Say podcast, your go to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the Growing KSR Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Very excited to be joined once again by Sean Smith of Go Big Blue Country. Sean, how are you? Doing fantastic, Jack. How are you? Oh, I butchered it. I didn't say how the heck are you. I, we, I, for branding purposes, I need to get that stuff straight for, for uniform, uniform episodes every single time. But Sean, we had a very big week last week with our debut of hosting Kentucky Sports Radio on Thursday where we broke down. We, we had John Rossine on the show. We had Davion Mintz on the show. Then we had Travis Branham at Breakdown Recruiting at the end of the show. We had an absolute blast, Sean, and I am very grateful that you were a part of it. And uh, I have to think that our debut on KSR was a pretty massive success. It was, it was a big-time success, given the reaction. Uh, I know I had a lot of people reaching out to me that day. I know you had a lot of people reaching out to you as well. And then even in the days that followed, I actually received a couple of DMs for the last few days of people, I think, that are just now going back and getting to listen to the podcast. But I thought it was good. I thought we did our job. We're the, we're the basketball podcast, and that's exactly what we talked. We stuck to our script and to who we are, and we didn't try to be something that we aren't. I think that's what people appreciated the most. Yeah, and it, it, was, it was just a, a, an absolute blast to talk, you know, recruiting with, with Travis. It, I think we had an, a pretty solid uh, bit of versatility in terms of just, uh, you know, recruiting info, team info, you know, team-specific info with John Rothstein on, and then, um, you know, obviously Davion Mintz coming on to talk about his return and what that meant for the program and all that good stuff. Really, really fun show. Very glad we were able to do that and grateful for the opportunity. And we talked quite a bit about the possibility of adding Kofi Coburn from Illinois and the differences, you know, what, what would it be like to add a guy like Kofi versus a Jalen Duran or, uh, you know, if the roster's done as of, as of today going into the 2021-2022 season. And today we got our first big update on the Kofi Coburn decision. And it's a pretty significant one, Sean. Kofi will be announcing his final decision on Friday uh, that is July 16th, and we will know by the end of the week if Kentucky, Kentucky will be adding a second-team All-American to the roster, Sean. Yeah, and you should be getting another episode of Sources Say, right? Because uh, we'll definitely talk about the outcome of that, regardless of what it ends up being. But, yeah, we, there's no dragging this thing out. I think that that's what we've been talking about. If, if Kofi was indeed going to transfer and leave the program, you kind of want to get him on your roster and on your campus and in workouts – as soon as possible uh, to kind of mesh and get ready for the season. And it, it would be perfect timing if it is Kentucky. You know, we expect uh, all the buzz has been Kentucky and all the positive talks. Nothing's changed on my end from the people that I've been talking to. Uh, so you, if you're John Calipari, you'd love to have him here right around maybe the end of the month, 1st of August, to kind of jumpstart and get ready for the season. Because you're, you're talking about a guy who would be meeting new people, working with new faces, uh, I think it would be big to get him here ASAP if it ends up being Kentucky. And there's been a lot of talk about the timing of this decision. I know UK just put out a here's here's our official numbers for the season, and and uh, Kofi announced that he that he was he announced his announcement not long after that. And uh, you know there's a lot of talk that right when Kofi put his pulled his name out of the NBA draft, uh, and he spoke so highly of Kentucky and say, oh, you know, Coach O's my guy. He's the reason why I committed to Illinois the first time around. Kentucky's going to be a very serious option for me, those sorts of things. He did say that he was wanting to take visits. And uh, to this point, he has not taken any visits. And there's a lot of Kentucky fans right now that are freaking out because he did not officially take a visit to Lexington, um, at least publicly. He has not gone uh, – he's not taken any real visit to Lexington. But here's what people need to know it is a dead period right now. So while players are able to, you know, kind of what like Bryce Hopkins did during his recruitment where they can technically go to a campus and take basically an unofficial visit by themselves, there is no in-person face-to-face contact on visits right now. They are able to go uh, to campuses and kind of do a self-guided tour and do those sorts of things. Um, I don't know the difference. I, I know during COVID, like Bryce Hopkins was not not even allowed to enter the UK basketball facilities. That was just a big no go. I don't know what the difference is now that the those restrictions are lifted, but it's still a dead period. I don't know if they have the same 
all facility doors are locked. You're not even, even able to go in there. I don't know how that part works out, but I do know that, during dead period, like I, people were talking about Marcus Carr is taking a, a visit to Texas today. And people were like, well, how is Marcus Carr going to Texas? But UK couldn't host Kobe Coburn. Well, it's because Marcus is going on on his own, um, you know, unofficial where it's not face to face contact. You're not legally allowed to have face to face contact right now. And I, my understanding is during an evaluation period, which is during the weekends, these next couple weekends, you know, Peach Jam, EYBL. I think coaches can sacrifice that evaluation time to stay back and host visitors if need be. But after a full year of COVID and not having this in-person evaluation, this, this time is so valuable for coaches for scouting. And, and uh, after missing that in-person feel last year, coaches are just not willing to sacrifice a, a, a recruiting weekend out on the road for anybody. I mean, it doesn't matter who it is. You know, you, you can do Zoom calls. You can figure that stuff out. There has been contact, back and forth contact between Kofi's camp and Kentucky. So that side of things isn't that big of a deal. There's not a, a whole lot of worry there. Sean, we talked on our episode of KSR this weekend um, or last week that Kentucky was feeling very confident going into last week, that um, they, they had kind of – they'd been talking to the team, to the players about the possibility of what this would, what this would do and that they think that – um, even going into this past weekend that they thought there was a pretty solid chance that UK was going to, uh, was going to get them. I will add, um, I, there was a little bit of hesitation on Kentucky side about adding a player, uh, a, you know, seven foot, 285 pound player like Kofi uh, to the mix with Oscar Sheway already in the fold and the front court already, already pretty loaded. And there was a, you know, just kind of from a fit perspective, they were trying to decide, do we go all in on this? and kind of give up hope on Jalen Duran. Uh, do we, it's kind of like that, you know, one in the hand, one in the hand, two in the bush type deal that we kind of talked about on KSR. Do you take the guy that might be more of a fit concern because he can't stretch the floor because he's not a great passer. He's more of a back to the basket, uh, just kind of trotting big versus a Jalen Duran who can stretch the floor a little bit, a great passer, kind of that more versatile. He, you could plug him in at the four where Kofi is absolutely a, a, a pure five. And uh, there, there was some concern about that, and that is something that Kentucky's talking about. And, and to be totally honest, I don't know where they stand as, as we're talking on, on Tuesday afternoon. I don't know where they stand in favoring one over the other. And, and, uh, and I, obviously, I think there has been some movement um, in, in terms of Kofi wanting to make a decision known publicly. So that, that's going to be something that we're going to be doing a lot of digging on here in the next couple of days. But that was something that was brought up. And I will add that um, I was in, you know, we'll, we'll, talk about this here in a second with, with CJ Frederick's injury and or lack thereof and, and kind of the specific specifics of that going into it but in conversations yesterday I was asking about Kofi and all that there is a pretty strong presence on the team right now that players would that they want to add Kofi Coburn they know what he did last year at Illinois they know the kind of game-changing talent that he is and, and how he would elevate the team to uh, you know elite status national title contending status um, but I will say that it's not a consensus right now that, that the players um, would like Kofi Coburn, that there, there are um, some voices that, that have made it clear that, that the fit is not a great one considering all the pieces they have right now. And that, um, you know, with, with Oscar Sheway already on, in the fold, uh, it, it does create some need for maybe like a platoon or a, uh, you know, at least a, a strong rotation of, um, kind of two out, two in type deal in the front court at the four and five. That part is is a little bit um, more concerning. But the overall, I believe the overall uh, majority, the vast majority of the players on the team do want Kofi Coburn on the roster. But, Sean, I, I will admit that there there is some hesitation. And, and Sean, I'm, I'm curious to know what you think about um, that hesitation and, and the possibility of, um, knowing that if you go all in on Kofi and you accept his commitment, that you are basically giving up Jalen Duran, who may end up being the better fit at Kentucky. Are you? Are we talking hesitation from players, or just hesitation from people within the program? Oh, I, well, hesitation from your side as well. Knowing you know, knowing how the rotations work and the fit of the roster, and 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 but knowing that yeah, they're they're it's not a it's not a general consensus yeah. that. Kofi would be just an automatic plug and play perfect fit there are a few select voices that did kind of give some pushback to it that said you know I, I 
I, I don't know about this yet. I, this is something that we need to discuss a little bit more. But the, over, the overall majority of the team, w- w- they were outspoken about the possibility of adding a, a guy like Kofi. And I think, you know, so I, I guess I, just I your think, thoughts on all of that. Well, I think if it comes down to the overall majority, then you – majority rules, right? I mean, if, yeah. that's, if that's kind of – you make a decision as a team and if that's what it is. But when it comes to deciding between Kofi Coburn or Jalen Gurn, I think that's a feel the staff has to have. If they – if like, it's one of those things, if you're confident that you got the job done with Jalen Duren and you're confident that he is indeed reclassifying and going to come to Kentucky, then obviously when you're talking what it would do for the program, I think that's the bigger one because it would show – especially during NIL, I think it would be a great kickstart for John Calipari to kind of announce his presence in a new era of recruiting. But when you're talking about winning a national championship and competing and trying to win the ninth one and, you know, to get better from last year, not be 9-16, and 16, add more depth to, to your roster, I think you go with which one you think is the for sure guy. And maybe Kofi's that guy right now. Like, I think that obviously Kofi's making a decision later this week, which is much quicker than what Jalen Hearns is going to do. So, if they're confident on it, I I think that you got to add Kofi. But and all, there is questions. There is concerns about the fit and what it does to the roster. But the one thing that I'll say about that, and we're going to get into the C.J. Frederick injury and everything going on in the procedure he had yesterday. But leading up to that, you had people that were saying there's too many guards. What is John Calipari going to do? Well, yesterday morning when everyone was panicking, thinking that CJ was lost for a majority of the year, possibly the entire year, you started to see that depth. Like, I remember having a conversation, I think it was with you and someone else. I said, look, losing CJ honestly doesn't change how I feel about this team because they're so deep with the return of Davion Mintz. That's that's where I think it's big because you're an injury to Oscar Sheway away right now from being rail thin at the five. And I just think that that's too big of a risk. Yeah, I, 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 that's kind of that's kind of where I stand on things. And I'm going to be totally honest with with our listeners right now. I think it's it's time for honesty hour. Oscar Sheboy is is going to be a fantastic player for who he is and what he brings to the table. He is a a massive energy guy. He's a back to the basket. You know, he's a um, you know, not even necessarily necessarily a rim runner, but more so a cleanup specialist. Where he's going to be able to grab those offensive rebounds, he's going to be able to gla- you know, um, you know, catch lobs and 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 do a lot of the dirty work down low, and and that's going to be where where the majority of his baskets are made. And he's going to you know he's going to be a pretty strong eight and eight guy next year, at Kentucky. But to say that there is to say that you turn down the possibility of adding a second team all American in Kofi Coburn, a seven foot, 285 pound, absolute just monster of a human being to turn down that possibility for Oscar Sheboy, I think it'd be a mistake on Cal's part. I got to be honest. I'm a huge Oscar fan. I think he's going to have a fantastic role. I know we talked to him about, you know, his dream of playing at Kentucky and the road that it took to get there and kind of the pit stop that he had to make in West Virginia. And we've talked in the past that, that his stop in West Virginia was not what he wanted. He wanted to, he always wanted to go to Kentucky. That was a decision that was kind of made for him. And, and uh, you know, something that we always talked about how much we disagreed with, and it was just a kind of an ugly process. But he ended up, to, you know, to the, his dream school where he always wanted to be, and the story is fantastic. But, Sean, if, call me selfish and, and call me, you know, you know, lack of heart or whatever, but – we're talking about the possibility of adding a second team all American that is that is gonna bring your team to national title contender status from day one. And you can't worry about feelings after what Kentucky just went through this past season. And I think that's something that Oscar might need to look at himself in the mirror and that Cal might need to discuss with him. And it's like, look, you're gonna have your role. Where there's you know, Kofi only averaged like twenty seven minutes per game last year, so it's not like you're adding a thirty eight minute guy where your your playing time's just gonna drop immediately, um, and significantly. Oscar is still gonna get his nineteen, twenty minutes a game should Kofi Coburn commit. Um, but it, I, I, I do think that he will be taking a, a lesser role if Kofi Coburn comes. And I think that's something that, that he's just going to have to accept. And I think that that's, a, that's something that Cal, Cal can't turn down Kofi Coburn because he's worried about hurting Oscar's feelings. I, I genuinely, 
Uh, I genuine, genuinely believe that, and I, I don't think you can worry about Keon Brooks' feelings you, or Jacob Toppin's feelings. And I, I know there's something to be said about loyalty, and, and I'm, not, I'm not discounting that and, and certainly not discounting team chemistry and, and those sorts of things. But I think that goes back to what we were talking about with, with, with kind of the general consensus and the overall majority of, of what the roster is feeling. If you do an honest poll, and I think that's kind of what we were talking about with some players being outspoken, like, yeah, that might be an issue. But if you get a – a joint agreement with the roster that like, Hey, like that, like that platoon team, 2014, 15, if you get that agreement where it's like, look, you're not, you're not going to have the same role that, that you would have had if, if Kofi wasn't here, you wouldn't, you, you know, you, you are going to have to take a back seat, but are you willing to sacrifice that for the betterment of the team as a whole? Are you going to sacrifice that to get better? I mean, imagine Kofi going heads up with Oscar and, and Oscar going, heads up with Kofi in practice. I mean, it's, it's iron sharpens iron type deal where, where those type of players will better themselves and develop themselves. I think it's a sacrifice deal. Are you willing to, to, you know, take a diminished role or, you know, less shots or less minutes or less, you know, touches on the ball for the better, betterment of the team where it's, it's inarguable that, that adding a guy like Kofi is a game changer for the program and will automatically push them up to title Kinder. Uh, title contender status Sean I think it's a risk you got to take I think you have to take it and when you look at the roster as it stands right now it's kind of Oscar's spot is the one spot that really you're not having he's not really having to sacrifice much we expect him to be the best of the best out of the group that they have but you move up to the backcourt and you see dudes probably gonna have to sacrifice all across that one through three and same thing at Keon Brooks. I mean, Jacob Toppin's on the roster there. So I, I just think it strengthens the roster. It adds depth. There's no such thing as too, as too much depth, in my opinion, because when it comes down to it, the best of the best is going to play. Yeah. And that, that's what I think Cal needs to do. Now, if, this, if, this, if there hadn't been a 9-16 and 16 season leading up to this, maybe Cal could say, all right, we're, we're fine. But when you just had your worst season in history – you kind of got to make sure you're doing everything to, to right the ship and make sure that you're getting back on track. And obviously you're not going to pass up on the opportunity to add a second team all American to your roster that wants to come to Kentucky. Uh, and one thing too, that we're not really talking about, you know, who benefits the most from this, in my opinion, if it does happen is Damian Collins. Cause imagine what he's going to have to do to fight every single damn practice against both those guys. Yeah. yeah I think that's a fantastic I mean, point. Yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, obviously he's going to beat and bang with Oscar right now, but you got two of those dudes. You you can't run away from both of them. You maybe <laughs> can run and hide if you want, but if you got two in there, you're you're getting hit. And I just think that it's something that you you got to take the chance on. You got to take the risk. You we mentioned I mentioned earlier with CJ Frederick's surgery and his procedure that he had. You can never have too much depth because can you imagine how Kentucky fans would have been reacting yesterday morning had that injury been a little bit more, you know, like impactful for the season and then they not having back. And then Davey Mintz had gone over season play. Yeah. Like things we would have, we would have had a completely entirely different feel, but the depth didn't really result in a ton of panic yesterday. Yeah. We, let's just go right into that. Um <laughs> So I get a text at <laughs> – so just to give a background to just how crazy and, frankly, horrible my day was yesterday and, and just kind of the back, back story of somebody that, that is in the business when there's, when there's news of that magnitude breaking. And, Sean, we talked throughout the day and just kind of the, uh, everything going on with that. Uh, so I get a text at – I get a text at 9 o'clock-ish in the morning or so, right when I, I wake up. I look over and I have, a, I have a text on my phone that says, um, I think, uh, I think CJ Frederick broke his leg. Uh, Ryan is going to break it on the show this morning on KSR. And I go, cause I'm, I'm very close with, with CJ Frederick's camp. You know, I, that's something that I could get to the bottom to very quickly and figure out, you know, if, if there's, if there's something of substance, like a, a broken leg, that should be something that I could find out very quickly. If there's not, I, it feels like something I could dismiss rather quickly. And, uh, before we get to a, a massive announcement of that nature on the show. So I immediately call the people that I need to call in, in CJ's camp. First couple calls, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? 
you have I have no idea what you're talking about. People that if if CJ Frederick has a broken leg, they would be in the hospital with him, not having no no idea. So from the jump, and I, at first I, I even admitted to him later, I was like, look, I kind of thought you were lying to me because uh, you know you just you just don't know how quickly they want the, how they want the news to kind of get out there or you know that sort of thing. So at first I kind of chalked it up to all right, they're just not ready to talk yet. They're just they're just being quiet about it, which. I would totally understood completely fine. You know, that it's, if it's something of that magnitude, they want to release it on their own terms. I totally get that. But it turned out rather quickly that things were not as they seemed on the surface level. Um, there was no massive, like new injury. Like he didn't, wasn't in practice and wasn't in pain down and, and broke his leg or did, did anything ridiculous. Um, and that was something that was conveyed to me rather quickly, but shortly after, Ryan went on the radio and, and said that publicly. And, and um, what's funny is, or not necessarily funny, but it, it kind of sucked was um, one of the family members that I talked to was kind of felt out of the loop and, and like, you know, their heart sank. They were heartbroken. They were like, oh my gosh, the dream of watching our kid play, uh, you know, play at Kentucky this year, something that we've talked about our whole lives and the, this massive possibility, it might be coming crashing, you know, crashing down in, in one quick weekend accident like what the heck happened they you know they were thinking the worst it was kind of a a, it was it just sucked it just really sucked how the news kind of turned around and and it it created a a difficult situation um but I found out later on in the afternoon throughout the afternoon I kind of got I was able to piece by piece information and updates as it was happening and by late afternoon going into the evening I almost had like an hour by hour breakdown of how things unfolded things and and kind of the 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 magnitude of the situation so Wednesday or I guess earlier in the week but Wednesday was when he was when CJ officially realized hey I got this it wasn't a pain but it was like a nagging uh, irritation or I guess you could say Um, and he he realized he's like yeah this you know it's the same the same stuff that was bothering me before at Iowa Um, you know I really want to get this checked out so he goes he gets it checked out by the team doctors they get an x-ray done on him the minor injury, and I don't want to get into the specifics of what it is, and, and um, the, the family was kind of hesitant. They don't want to put you know, the actual diagnosis or anything like that out there. But, it's, it's, again, it's not a big deal whatsoever. The x-rays confirmed what, the, what they were kind of interested about. Doctors came to them and said, hey, this is something that will absolutely heal on its own if he wants to hold out and, you know, just kind of take things easy over the next couple months he should be okay by the start of the season but this will absolutely heal on its own but the only guarantee that the family got regarding cj being able to not only start the season on time and to be ready for the you know season opener against duke was but even before that going into the preseason those sorts of you know the, the t- pushing the timeline way up was to have this surgery done so he did have this surgery they they uh, doctors gave him that option on friday uh, they kind of thought about it going into the weekend and then saturday they officially said saturday was his birthday um saturday they officially decided screw it let's go all in and and get this surgery done CJ wanted what was going to put him on the court the fastest uh, and this was easily the option that would do this Um, I know there were some other reports out there about a timeline like oh the staff's about to send the kids home for a a month and he's going to be ready by that that's not true he's not it's like there's they're not going to rush him back that you know I I think he's going to be able to do some slow um, you know, ease himself into, you know, workouts and those sorts of things. He's going to be on crutches for a week, but um, he's, there's, there's going to be no real rush. There's, it's not like a month timeline or a month and a half timeline. This is going to be a, we're going to take this thing day by day and we'll see how it goes. But uh, by the end of summer, he should absolutely be back on camp or in, not back on campus, back on the practice floor. And maybe one, I, I, I think a hundred percent, but at the very latest early fall, he will be absolutely back. Uh, to full strength, 100%. This was a this was a no big deal. Um, I understand where there was some miscommunication there, um, and I don't think Ryan is is you know at, at fault for his report. He was you know he was doing his job. There was a surgery that happened early uh, early Monday morning, and it you know it, it, I, I understand where there could be some some lines crossed and those sorts of things. But this is something that Kentucky fans should not be worried about whatsoever. The doctors are in. I, 
I think there was some concern initially because the P, the doctors at Iowa didn't they he didn't get any surgeries done at Iowa or anything and they wanted um, I think there was it's a lot of it was some leftover stuff from back then that probably should have been handled back back at Iowa um, and that I think they kind of regret that they didn't handle back then but with this procedure that they got done this should clean up any lingering issues there's going to be no long term uh, effect to it or, or anything the doctors are just absolutely overly optimistic and the family's overly optimistic about how they got in there they got everything cleaned up it was a wildly successful surgery uh and all of the other stuff that we dealt with in the past with him you know with plantar fasciitis and the stretch stress reaction um earlier on in his his career at iowa that stuff's gone it's cleaned up he's good to go sean and uh kentucky fans should be very excited for his welcomed return to uh the, to the practice floor and ultimately the uh, game floor here this fall. Yeah, it's uh, definitely good news. Uh, fans were thinking the worst yesterday. I know when you called me yesterday morning, we're sitting here thinking, here we go. You know, another injury. It never seems like Kentucky has a healthy basketball team, but no, that's from for what it's from what the day started with it being just. So you you can think a lot of different things there. You're thinking the entire season. You're thinking middle of the season. But then you see how followed it up. And obviously it was something that they didn't want to put out there at the beginning. They probably kind of just wanted it to be a, just to get it done and then uh, really not let a whole lot of people know about it. But we also know that reports and news, stuff that they want to keep quiet, Jack, we always find out from somebody. Yeah, and I think that's kind of where a lot of the frustration came from. I know – to put that out there, Kentucky was not pleased about how things unfolded yesterday. And Coach Cal was pretty pissed off about just kind of how, how things were presented because this was something that I don't want to say Kentucky was trying to hide it, but this was something that, that Kentucky felt was like, like it wasn't a big deal, that, that this was something CJ wanted to get done, that they kind of talked things over with the family. They were like, yeah, let's get this thing over with. I want to be – you know, I want this – I want the stuff that I went through at Iowa to be put put behind me. You know, I, he was frustrated in his time at Iowa about how, you know, he, you know, he would be back on the floor for a couple games and the, the stuff would creep back up. And it, it was just that kind of back and forth. Like he just couldn't get past it. And when the option to kind of get it all past him by getting this cleanup procedure done presented itself, it was like, Oh hell yeah, let's get this thing done. Let's get this over with. We want to, you know, get back healthy. Everything's good to go. And Kentucky was just going to like, like, I don't, I genuinely don't think that we would have even gotten a public report about this. I think that this is something that um, I think Kyle Tucker said that the, 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 they are sent planning on sending the kids home uh, at the end of this, or he said at the end of this, uh, at the end of this week, I was told at the end of July, uh, it's going to be a three week process and they're going to be back at the end of August, but I, I'm not 100% certain on that. That was just kind of a, something I was told in passing, but, um, but the, the plan was, by the time they were kind of going to just keep him off to the side and, you know, when they release the practice videos and all that stuff, just, you know, not include pictures of him or whatever, you know, no big deal, hoping that nobody would just, nobody would notice it. And then by the time they got back later this summer, you know, he'd be slowly starting to ramp things back up. And then when things actually mattered, he'd be back to 100% on the practice floor that, that this could have been something that could have been swept under the rug completely. Nobody would have ever found out about it. Fans would have no idea when the season started because he was going to be hundred percent back to full strength and you know, no big deal whatsoever. And it just kind of became a big deal and kind of got blown a little bit out of proportion. And it, it what happened happened. It's all right. We're, you know, we're, we're moving past it. The, at the end of the day, C.J. Frederick is going to be just fine. Everything is is perfectly okay, and you will see him suit up in blue and white uh, during the season opener at Madison Square Garden in, uh, against Duke in November. So, Sean, plenty of optimism on that front. Yeah, the the news to start the day it seemed like it was going to be a really massive story, but by the end of the day, the story wasn't as big. Uh, which is a good thing when you're talking about an injury. They, you know, Cal expects him back. And I understand, too, that you have a part of the fan base that maybe questions Cal and his honesty when it comes to injuries. I know, but look, sometimes there's in the past, there's been some information that, you know, you, you want to keep family privacy, you want to keep yeah. the privacy between the player and the doctors. 
and things like that, that I think that Cal really actually has this timetable in his mind and then maybe they'll have a setback or something will happen. But it doesn't seem like this will be the case. Uh, I know I, I looked up some, some stuff when it comes to hairline fractures and things like that. I mean, we're some people, some places have said six to eight weeks, and then you kind of start resuming some activity here and there. And then this is a this is an issue that you wanted to get cleaned up. This is C.J. Frederick being proactive about this and saying, look, I don't want this to flare up on me when I start this season in November and then me miss time in December and January. And then by the time that happens, Jack, you're so far out of the rhythm and out of the, the loop of things that you probably wouldn't have had a really an, an impactful season from C.J. So this has given C.J. an opportunity to get this cleaned up, something that has really – hindered him and limited him at Iowa. We have no idea how good C.J. Frederick can be because he dealt with this all last season. Yeah. So this is good to get this thing cleaned up, take this time. You're going to have some time to stay off of it and then get ready and uh, hopefully join your team and be ready and healthy for the season. I was told that Cal was very supportive of this decision uh, on C.J. This is something that he was kind of rooting for personally you know he was going to let him do what he wanted to do but I think there was a concern on Cal's side of things that had he pushed it off and said nah I'm going to play through it because he just he's here's something fans need to know about him he's tough as nails there's a reason that he played through a lot of the injuries that he did last uh, the last couple years at Iowa and he's he's just a tough dude he wants to fight through stuff and I think there was an initial per push to start with where he'd be like, eh, screw it. You know, I think he actually started feeling some of the stuff early on in the week. And then it wasn't until Wednesday where he was like, yeah, you know, I, th I think this might be something I need to get checked out. Originally, I, I wouldn't be shocked if, if this was something that he originally said, I might just want to fight through this play. You know, I don't want to miss any time. I'm, I'm going to be set back in training and I don't want to lose my spot to somebody else or, you know, those sorts of things, which I've also heard that he's, he's playing very well in practice and, uh, um, I don't want to say that he'd be a starter, a starter from day one, but um, that that his focus when he first got back on campus was to get his game back in game shape, uh, cut some weight, and, and you know, kind of transform his body a little bit. And he has done that. Uh, definitely impressed on that front as well. So I, I think there was a lot of optimism that um, maybe you know, still kind of working through some of the kinks early on, but down the road he would definitely be up there for you know, fighting for starting status at, at the end of the day. But um, I think that Cal, at the end of the day, he was worried that if he pushed this off and kind of waited out this decision and, and that something might pop up later down the line you know, during the season. And I think Cal was just kind of worried, like, you know, what, why this is the perfect timeline. If there was ever a time to get this stuff done, get it over with, get it behind us, it's now. Why wait until the, you know, think that things are okay and just kind of let it heal on its own and then have it pop back up in, in November or December or January or God forbid February or, or March where it would take them out for the rest of the season. Why even risk that when we could get it taken care of right now, get in there, get it taken care of and, and he's good to go uh, for the season and, and moving forward for the rest of his career. There's a lot of optimism on doctor size that he, on the doctor's side of things that, uh, that this is not going to pop back up ever. Like this is going to be something he could put behind him forever for the rest of his basketball career. So just a lot of optimism on that side, nothing to freak out about. Uh, fans should be definitely excited about the possibility of adding uh, CJ Frederick to the fold here in the next couple months. Um, and then certainly by the time the season starts. So we'll end it with this final topic. And Sean, it's a pretty freaking big one. Reed Shepard, after we went on here and kind of talked about the frustration of why Kentucky didn't go see him at that Shelbyville event a couple weeks back. And, you know, it, is there going to be real interest in Kentucky? You know, what kind is Cal going to want to deal with the, uh, you know, the, the possibility of adding that in-state talent and the drama that comes with it with Kentucky fans and that sort of thing? All of those answers were, were – all those questions were answered this past weekend when Reed Shepard officially got his scholarship offer from the University of Kentucky. And, Sean, it's, it's a big one, and it's one that um, I think unofficially assigned – he's going to be able to make his own decision at the end of the day, but I think that this is something that fans are automatically kind of penciling him in as a future Wildcat. And I think it's something that there's certainly excitement about and there's reason to be excitement about, Sean. Yeah, it's, it, it was one that I'm excited about. I was very excited that Reed got his offer. I've, I've been a big fan of Reed Shepard. I started writing stuff about Reed Jack probably 16 months ago 
because yeah. I was expecting this thing to kind of go nuclear at some point, and that's what's happened. Like this, like Reed Shepard, when they wrote the, when Pat Forty put out the Sports Illustrated story on Reed Shepard, that was when it instantly announced his arrival, whether Jeff and them really wanted it to be small or not. That was when it finally just went bonkers when it come to the the following and the way the state has kind of rallied around him. I think that the state of Kentucky had rallied around Reed Shepard before he ever even had his first major offer. Uh it's exciting. I mean, it's exciting for me because the first Kentucky team that I really got an attachment to as a kid was Jeff's 1998 team yeah. where they won the national championship. So it's been cool. Jeff is someone that I have a relationship with. I've known Jeff for a while now, talked to him multiple times, had a really, really good conversation with Jeff Sunday about the weekend. And, you know, I, I didn't want to reach out to him because I knew, I, I knew that other reporters and stuff that were in Birmingham were working with him for stories. Uh, so I texted him Saturday and I said, hey, enjoy the day. Enjoy watching your son. I said, if you're on your way home and you want to talk, just give me a call. So he gave me a call Sunday evening around 630. And I put out a story. And I know we had talked about Kentucky not showing up in Shelbyville. We we didn't criticize Kentucky. We questioned why not send an assistant, you know, yep. up the road, what, 45, 50 minutes. Yep. But you know what they did? You know what they did, Jack? What? They made a loud statement by not going to Shelbyville, but then going four deep in Birmingham with the head coach, your top assistant. I mean, your two young guys on the roster that are really, you know, your energy, your energy right there in Chin Coleman and Jay Lucas. I thought that was a huge statement. And then not having them sitting together, I think was the biggest thing too. You had Orlando and Tigua and Cal sitting right there at center court, and then you had Jay and Chin off to the side. So everywhere we look, Kentucky's standing there. Uh, so I think it was a bigger statement to do that. And Jeff had the perfect quote to me. I don't have my story pulled up that I published yesterday. I don't know if you read that or not. But we talked about Shelbyville. We talked about Kentucky not making it up, up the road to it. But here's the thing. Jeff said that what would that have – like, yeah, Kentucky could have been there. They could have sent Jay Lucas or Chin Coleman. But Jeff says what would that have said to the 2022 guys that they were recruiting? in that moment. And he also said that, look, John Calipari had a job to do and his job right now is to make sure that Kentucky gets this thing right. And they're not nine and 16 again, because that comes before Reed comes if Reed ends up playing at Kentucky. So I thought Jeff really understood why Kentucky wasn't there. Obviously it was a much louder statement for Kentucky to go four deep in Birmingham. But I thought that was really cool that Jeff was like, look, Kentucky needed to be all in on Shaden Sharp, Derek Lively, and these guys that they were hosting for 2022 before they really needed to worry about a kid that was going into his junior year of high school that didn't even have an offer yet. And another thing, too, Birmingham was the top competition. That was more and better competition than what we watched in Shelbyville. I think Jeff got answers about Reed then, and I think that Reed got answers about himself. But most importantly, I think Kentucky got answers about who Reed Shepard was, and it didn't take long for him to extend an offer. Yeah, I think – you, he put that perfectly, and I think you put that perfectly. I think the, the it, I think it was more so just from a convenience factor. Where it's like, well, these other guys are here. Why can't they do it? But I, I do think it's pretty telling that that Cal, and I think it's a hell of a pitch for guys like Derek Lively and guys like Chris Livingston, guys that were you know on campus during that event. Uh, I think it's pretty telling on their part as well that you know, in terms of a recruiting pitch for them that like, hey, we were able – all these other coaches are down the road going to these other events and doing all that stuff. They're not even hosting official visitors this weekend. Guess what? We're hosting all of you guys, and we're not even taking the time to go uh, during the first evaluation well, period of, of the period uh, of the year. We want to be here with you. And I think it's a pretty solid recruiting pitch for those kids that were already on campus. And I think it's pretty, pretty telling for Reed and his camp that they wanted to wait for the, you know, the big spotlight and – and, and make it worth their while if they were going to make it happen. Well, and you too, an, another thing too that we haven't even discussed with this, and it, I didn't even think of it. I wish I thought of this when I was writing the story. But you know what's different about, well, obviously, Jeff and Stacy played at Kentucky. That's what's different about it when you're talking about all these other recruits and the five stars and four stars. It doesn't matter what they're ranked. But when you're talking about Jeff Shepard and that response to me that he gave me for that story, that's coming from a dude that cares about the Kentucky basketball program. Yeah. You don't get that in any situation when you're recruiting a kid to Kentucky. You're, you don't, these families don't genuinely care about the program, right? 
until their kid is in the program. Well, this is coming from a parent that says, yeah, like it's, I want you to offer my kid. I'm, I'm so glad that you've offered my son that he has an opportunity if he wants to, to play at the same place as mom and dad did. But I, I thought that that was really cool of Jeff that that response not only showed that he gets it, but it also shows that that's a guy that still loves this program and still cares to say, look, Cal needs to get this figured out before he worries about this. What kind of statement would that have made to these 2022 guys that are playing before Reed plays college basketball? I, th- I think that's what it says the most. With them really coming out and saying, yeah, this, I, I'm like a basketball fan. That's my program. I think that's kind of what it said, too. Yeah, I agree. And everybody makes such a big deal about the, the relationship that Cal has with, with Jeff and, and kind of what th- things that have been, you know, quotes have been dating back to like 2012, I think was the first time, 2013, the first time that uh, Jeff said something to the effect of, I feel more comfortable at the Louisville basketball facilities with Rick Pitino there than I do it, you know, in Lexington with John Calipari there. And there's, you know, there's been some not even private beef in terms of quotes and th- those sorts of things, but very public. Um, so uh, the, for him to kind of put everything to the side and look at this from a pure, this is my son. This is what's best for my son. This is a kid that admittedly grew up a diehard Kentucky fan. And he had a, you know, blue room with all the, you know, UK gear and autographs from all of Cal's top players and those sorts of things. This is a kid, you know, this is, this is a dad that is taking off his, he's, he's looking at it, you know, kind of taking a step back and looking at it without any biases or any, um, you know, not worrying about any of the excess baggage that comes with any of this stuff. He, he said, look, this is my son's decision. I have a love for the University of Kentucky. This is where I went. My son, you know, it knows kind of what I mean to this program. That's why he likes Kentucky is because of, of where things stood with me and where who I was as a, as a player back in the day. And just kind of, I, I love his... I'm going to take a step back and not make this in a, in a world where so many parents, you know, try to make it about them and make the story about them. Jeff is a guy that genuinely just wants the story to be about Reed and his son and doing what's best for him. And I think that's such an awesome, he's handling it such a, in such a professional way. And I think Cal to, you know, absolutely to his credit, I think they handled it in a, in a perfect way. I think there was just a sense of just give this kid a chance. If they if they see him in person and he's not the player that everybody hypes him up to be, then don't offer him a scholarship. And I think that's one of the quotes that, that I think Jeff gave somebody else uh, where it was just like, you know, I, I didn't want them to just give my kid a scholarship because he's Reed Shepard. I wanted them to recruit him because he's recruitable, because they, they – because they think that he is a Kentucky level talent, not because he's an in-state kid or he's a son of a former Kentucky legend, but because he is Kentucky material. And all I cared about was that they gave him a shot. All I wanted was for Cal to look at him in person and make the judgment. If he's a Kentucky quality player, take him. If he's not, then don't. They gave him that shot this weekend, went four deep, and they realized that he is Kentucky quality. They offered him immediately. And I think it's pretty damn telling that, um, how quickly they offered just after watching them in person two times. It was two, it was two games. And they said, all right, well, I've seen enough. We're going to offer them a scholarship. I think Kentucky handled it very, very well this weekend. And I think the re, the, the Shepherd family handled it extremely well. And uh, I would be, I would be quite shocked if he ended up anywhere other than Kentucky, considering yeah. all of the connections, considering him growing up as a diehard Kentucky fan and, the NIL factor with, I mean, you got to consider that he's, he's going to be just made for NIL here in Kentucky and all the possibilities that he's going to have to, to make money. I mean, I think when you put everything together, it just makes way too much sense for him to end up at, at Kentucky. And I think Kentucky fans should start preparing for that. And, and it's not just the NIL possibilities with just him alone. It's the NIL possibilities alongside his two-time national champion dad and final four MVP and his mom who ranks top 10, top 15 in a number of categories. I think that's the dialogue. They want him, but he convinced her. We're talking about keeping it in the family business. I mean, there, there's a lot of T-shirt possibilities and things and billboards that you can throw out there. Uh, but, Jack, here's the deal. We didn't cover the John Wall recruitment, and it didn't last very long. But as far as recruitment – that we've covered, this will be the most polarizing recruitment that we've been a part of in our time as beat writers covering UK. And it's not 
the most impactful, like Reed Shepard's not John Wall, Reed Shepard's not Anthony Davis or these guys, but what he is is the state gets him. It's going to be like I said it in the story the other day. They called the gym there at North Laurel the jungle. That's yeah. exactly what it's going to be for the next two years. Can you imagine? And just from a standpoint, and I, I get it because I live there. Yeah. I live in the 606. You get Kentucky football commitments. You get Louisville players. You get other Division One players that come from that part of the state. Or you get women's basketball players. You know, Blair Green, Macy Morris, uh, Cassidy Rose as a U.K. women's basketball commit from that part of the state. But what you don't get is you don't get kids that are good enough to play Kentucky men's basketball. And there's a kid in London, Kentucky, that is more than good enough to play at Kentucky. And that is so good for a part of the state that is kind of it's, it's the heartbeat of this fan base. They're, they're diehards. I mean, there's diehards everywhere. But I'm telling you, you go to that part of the state where I live, you've been down that way a few times, everyone is a Kentucky basketball fan. You don't find Louisville fans down there. You find a few Tennessee fans. But I just think it's going to be so polarizing because you're going to get two years of it. And every gym that he steps foot in, it's going to be packed. He's going to be signing autographs. And the moment John Calipari drives to Eastern Kentucky and walks in a gym, it's going to go absolutely crazy. Wow. I'm very excited for that. And, Sean, I think you're, you're going to have a front row pass to any and all of those games because you're, you're just right down the road. So you, you're going to have a leg up on the, uh, you, you know, keeping your eye on who's showing up for – for for him and if, on the games, you, I think you're gonna. You're if gonna I don't to, get to fifty percent, if I don't get to fifty percent of his games the rest of his career, I failed. That's how <laughs> close I am. Like he's gonna play, he's gonna play in Millsboro, he's gonna play Bell County, he's gonna play Harlan County, he's gonna play all over the 13th region. Honestly, I probably should be there more than fifty percent. If you if we're not covering a UK game, I should probably be at North Laurel High School or somewhere in the 13th region watching him. Uh, which is kind of cool. Like this is one of the times it pays off for me to still be living that far south of Lexington. <laughs> Absolutely, it's going to be a fun journey to watch, and we will certainly be there to cover every every step along the way. Sean, this was a blast again. Um, thank you for joining me on KSR the other day. Thanks for coming on the show and, and being a massive part of it. We have a, we have a good time together, Sean. Absolutely. Uh, it's not it's not just my best partners. You're one of my best friends. Uh, I love the conversation on and off the air with you, and uh, really excited to see where we continue to take sources. Say the reaction in the last week or so has been amazing. Uh, I think we picked up some listeners. I certainly don't think we lost any. No. Yeah, I look at the numbers that were from from last week's Davion Mintz episode leading up to it. We had a bunch of uh, people went that went back and listened to it. The numbers are just going nuts as it is. So. This is our first episode since then, so we'll see what the numbers are looking like, but I, I'm willing to bet that, that, that they're going to be pretty impressive, and uh, I thank all of our new listeners, great for our old listeners, and uh, hopefully you guys stick along and, and stay with us along the way. We're going to have a lot of fun with it and uh, continue to give you all the best, latest, and greatest Kentucky basketball and recruiting news out there. So, Sean, uh, with that, we'll get out of here. Where can fans find your work? You can find my work at GoBigBlueCountry.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at GBBCountry. You can find me on Twitter at JackPilgrimKSR. Reach out to me via email at, K uh, at JPilgrim at KentuckySportsRadio.com. With that, we will be back next time for another Jam Pack Sources Say podcast. We will see you then.